Welcome back. We are continuing with the case of the Rosenbaums, where we have the uh, foster parent who took care of Millie shortly after the tragic incident where she lost her younger sister. Uh, we are, of course, he's still here with Joseph, but we're now joined by the infamous Judge Ashley Wilcott. How are you doing, Your Honor? Hi, Brian. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's always a pleasure. Now, Ashley, as you're seeing this case unfold and you're hearing about the travesty, uh, Joseph and I were talking about this witness, maybe not viewing the physical damage that happened to children, and I'm pretty sure you're very familiar with this, but maybe highlighting some of the emotional and psychological scars that were seen shortly after the incident. How is this going to impact the case? Well, it's very important because it paints the entire picture. I'm familiar with this case. I'm here in Georgia. I'm a juvenile court judge. I see these kinds of cases. And here's the thing it does. It provides the jury a roadmap, not just for the physical, but also, like you pointed out, Brian, for the emotional, for all the other issues that this child children suffered and this victim suffered. And they want to paint that picture because this, quite frankly, is a horrific crime. And uh, there's all kinds of things I could talk about. This was a system failure that this child ever died. Yeah, and, and, and I'm glad you brought that point. Um, how much of this, we've seen defense, defendants take the stand, we've seen defense attorneys argue, uh, there's culpability to be spread around. Uh, we've heard that this is the probably, I think Jennifer probably has it the worst right now. Joseph might be hiding in the background saying this is, I'm not as culpable, but how much of this is the system that has failed uh, these children and maybe not so much the culpability of the parents? Well. Let me not take away from their culpability. I think both of them are responsible for this child's death. I know that's what a jury's there to decide, not me. <laughs> Having said that, these are children that were placed in their home as foster children. This defendant female foster mother, Jennifer, worked at the district attorney's office. She had also worked at Capitol um, here in Georgia. So I think the appearance was she was a stand-up person and there may have been some assumptions that she would be an appropriate person to foster this child. Sometimes when those assumptions are made, all of the I's are not dotted, T's are not crossed. And I would suggest, I suspect that's what happened in this case. And I do not know that these children should have been in their home in the first place. My opinion, nobody else's. I would agree with that as well. Joseph, your, your input as to what we're seeing from this uh, witness as, they sh as she testifies. Again, she brings it back home and contextualizes this, uh, you know, because she's she's there in the immediate aftermath of this little angel passing on, and she she's there to take the sister uh, in into her home and to take care of this child. And uh, you know, this narrative again that the prosecution is putting forward, this is a key piece of the evidence moving forward. What this lady saw and what she. She uh, she heard these sorts of things and what she witnessed from from this child. Uh, uh, you know, she she gives us a, a, a moment in time that's now passed, but she can go back and talk about what she saw in the wake of this disaster, absolute disaster. Yeah. And the absolute power from what we call an uninterested witness. This is a witness who has no dog in the fight, no beef with the Rosenbaums, no, no strong connection with the prosecution. This is a person who opened their home to a child that faced something that no one should face, yet alone a, a toddler, and have to help and bring them back to a place of comfort and security. Uh, this is going to resonate very well with the jury, I would assume, uh, Judge Wilcott. Yeah, I agree with you. And what a great way to say it. She is, it's true. She does not have any interest in this case in terms of any personal interest. And she was subpoenaed and she had to come testify and that's what she's doing. And sometimes I've seen juries and I see attorneys who really are able to skillfully utilize that witness to bring home, they have no bias, they have no potential interest and therefore it's really factual and can really impact a jury. Yeah. And, and as defense attorneys, sometimes we hope that when a witness takes a stand, they say something that's a little bit off. The, the information that was provided about their earlier testimony might be inconsistent until we can impeach them. But Joseph, with, with this witness being completely uninterested, um, having really no dog in the fight, and maybe just giving us the clearest impression of what happened on a day-to-day -day basis with, with this child, I can't imagine what gems or nuggets or information that the defense and they get in cross-examination here yeah I, I can't either i you know i think that the defense needs to tread carefully here as they cross her because this is a woman who 
you know, is representative, hopefully, of everything uh, juxtaposed to the position of the other foster parents that represents all the good stuff about foster parents. Uh, she's she's there to try to help these kids, and uh, you know I think that that that's that's important here. Uh, but again, I bring us back to this idea that that she she doesn't have a dog in the fight. She just wants to care for the kids, and I think that's what makes her so powerful and compelling. Exactly, and we're going to hear what the defense has to say on cross examination and what, if anything, can come from it after this break.